Hello and welcome to today's Bible study. It's our 19 minutes or so with, with the Messiah. Today we're going to look at a study that is called The Weeds. The Weeds. And it's recorded for us in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30, then verses 36 to 43. Matthew chapter 13, 24 to 30, then verses 36 to 43. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, do you want us Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, First collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The righteous, then the righteous, will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. It's uh, interesting for me that just as we have this parable about the weeds. It's just about the time when we're going to start having to work in our gardens, flower beds, and the farmers are going to be planting their crops, and very soon we're all going to have to deal with the weeds that are going to come in those different areas. The weeds are a problem. And Jesus uses this picture to teach us something very important to teach us about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. And when Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, he's not talking about our heavenly kingdom that we are going to be in at the end of time. No, in this parable, he's talking about how God rules here on this earth through believers in his kingdom of grace. And that's what we're talking about here in our lesson for today. Our first question, Jesus uses the parable to teach about the kingdom of heaven, his gracious rule in the hearts of all true believers. In the parable of the weeds, Christ's kingdom is pictured in its earthly developmental stage. So in the parable, we have these following points in the parable, and our study asks us, who does the sower represent? And we know that Jesus himself explained this to his disciples. So we know that the sower, the one who plants the seed, is the Son of Man, or Jesus himself. And what does the field represent? The field represents the world that we live in, where God's word is preached. What does the good seed 
What does the good seed that produce wheat represent? It represents saving faith in those who come to know Jesus as their Savior. Who is the enemy? Who is the enemy? Our text tells us that the enemy is the devil himself. And what do the weeds represent? What do the weeds represent? They represent those who do not believe the unbelievers in this world. And what is the harvest? The harvest is a picture of the last day called Judgment Day. And who are the harvesters? It's interesting that Jesus in this parable says that the harvesters will be the angels. And we'll look at that closer as we continue through our lesson today. Question number two. What basic truth is Jesus teaching in this parable? What basic truth is he teaching us here? It's simply this, that believers and unbelievers have and will continue to live side by side in this world. We're always going to have unbelievers living right with us side by side in this world. Question number three. The Greek word that Jesus used for the weeds refers to a plant that was difficult to distinguish from true wheat, yet it bore grain that harbored a poisonous fungus. I did some research on this and it's interesting that this type of weed that's found in Palestine is called the bearded darnel. Perhaps you've referred to it from uh, the older translations of the Bible as tares, the wheat and the tares. Now this, this, this weed is noxious, poisonous, and it mimics many of the characteristics of wheat. And for a while, before they mature, the two plants are almost identical. But as they grow, the difference becomes apparent in the fruit, the grain. And you can tell the difference between the two of them. Unfortunately, Darnell is poisonous. And in enough doses, it can actually kill someone who eats it. So it's something a farmer does not want mixed with its harvest. So that's the picture here that Jesus is using. And the question we have, discuss how this weed is similar to the seed that the devil sows in our world. Well, the picture here is that the devil knows that he cannot defeat the church from the outside. So he's going to try to destroy it from the inside. And he knows that very often those who are true believers and those who are not true believers can look the same. And that's where he will bring unbelievers even into the church to sow, to sow the seed of poison. We can see from our notes in question number four, it may seem wise, it may seem wise then that uh, we should get rid of everyone who does not believe. And that is what question number four says. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? Why does this action seem like a good idea? Well, if you get rid of all those who don't believe, then they can't destroy the church from within. And we're given this next point in our lesson, give examples from history of the church attempting to exterminate unbelievers from this world. Well, it's interesting that if you look at Jesus and his disciples already even before Jesus went to suffer and die on the cross 
there just outside of Jerusalem, on his way to Jerusalem for the final point of his ministry where he would suffer and die, it's recorded for us in chapter 9 of Luke's Gospel something that happened. This is in Luke chapter 9, verses 52 to 55. We read here, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked the Lord, Do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. It's interesting. You see, the Samaritans felt that they were worshiping the true God, and they did not worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, and so they were giving the point that they were not following Jesus as the true Messiah. So James and John said, should we destroy them? Should we get rid of them? And Jesus said, no. Jesus said, no. And some other examples from history. The church <clears throat> has attempted to exterminate unbelievers in the past. We see beginning already here with Jesus' own disciples in Luke chapter 9. Also during the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, and even the peasant revolt at the time of the Reformation. <coughs> Excuse me. But we see that this is not what Jesus wants us to do. And he points it out to us in this Bible study about the weeds, just why we're supposed to continue to be in the world with unbelievers. Question number five. It is not Jesus' will that unbelievers be exterminated, but that these weeds be allowed to grow together with the wheat until the harvest. Jesus has in mind a blessing for both the weeds and the wheat. Well, we can see from our notes here the answer because faith is a matter of the heart and because believers and unbelievers are often indistinguishable. The church, in attempting to exterminate unbelievers, might mistakenly exterminate believers as well. In allowing both to grow together until the harvest, the Lord uses the temptations of the time to test and strengthen Christian faith and to make us more heavenly-minded. And God also uses this as a time of blessing to unbelievers, a time of grace in which they may hear the gospel and, God willing, be brought to saving faith. Question number six. Why must it be the angels and not God's servants, that is, his believers, who do the final harvesting? Who do the final harvesting? An interesting question indeed. And our notes give us an insight here where it says, only God can see whether or not there is faith in a person's heart. And he shares this knowledge with the angels who carry out God's judgment and who then brings those before Jesus to be judged. And it's an interesting passage that we can look up in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, where God talks about his angels and how they are given the task of serving in God's kingdom. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, 
Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? For further study, point number seven. Sometimes Satan's weeds may find their way into a Christian congregation. Discuss the havoc and damage this may cause. Well, indeed, if unbelief comes into a Christian congregation, there can be great, great con conflict and difficulty within the church. And we can look at what happened in history with the Catholic Church before the time of Luther, and now in our modern churches today, where so many are following the philosophy of the world and not sticking to with what God has to say in his word, and we're seeing lots of confusion and damage. In fact, there are some Lutheran churches that have now come right out and declared there is no such thing as hell, that God does not punish, and that sin is not deserving of punishment, but just a mistake, and that we should use God's word and God's grace to love one another and to live a God-pleasing life here on this earth. It's almost as if, why do we need church? Why do we need God? if there is no punishment for sin. What will a Christian congregation do if it finds weeds within it? Our notes give us an insight here. Satan can plant hypocrites in the church to destroy the unity in the church, harm the faith of believers, and hinder the church's mission to the world. But unlike their dealings in the world, the church will deal with the weeds in its midst out of love, using Matthew 18 to bring people back to the truth. For both the weeds and the wheat. Our next point, number eight. In spite of Satan's evil work and intentions in the world, our Lord comforts us with the promise that in all things God works for the good for those who love him. And we're asked to give examples from the pages of Scripture of how the Lord's promise was fulfilled. And we can see this throughout Scripture, starting at the very beginning with Adam and Eve, how God worked everything out for their good. God promised a Savior. We see the story of Isaac and Jacob. We see the story of Abraham. We see the story of Moses. We see the story of Elijah and Elisha. We see the story of David, all in the Old Testament, how God kept his promise and brought them through difficulties to keep his promise. And in the New Testament, we see the example of Peter and the other disciples how God brought them through trials and difficulties, and especially the Apostle Paul. So examples of how, how God can, can work all things for the good of his promise to save us. Let's end our study with a prayer. All the world is God's own field, fruit unto his praise to yield. Wheat and weeds together sown, unto joy or sorrow grown. First the blade and then the ear, then the full corn shall appear. Lord of harvest, grant that we, wholesome grain and pure, may be. Amen. From our Christian hymn book, number 613, verse 2. God bless you as you continue to be his wheat in this world. Thank you.